Hello, everyone, and welcome to Med Hedosnet Podcast Season 3, Episode 2. It's September 29th, 2022. We are live on YouTube and Facebook. I'm your host, Vika Slonyan, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, the talented Mr. Mike Ballian, where we discuss our great Armenian history, covering different eras, topics, and people. We have a special guest joining us tonight, all the way from Armenia, cartographer Ruben Galician, and our topic is Armenian historical maps, so he'll be joining us shortly. How are you, Mr. Balian? I'm good. You already had a slip of the tongue that Man, quick. Huh? Well, How excited are you? We're, we're, huh? You know, I'm rusty. We're getting back. <laughs> rusty? Yeah, I, don't know. I, think back. I think you're pretty excited. <laughs> I know I am. Yeah. Maps. Um, <laughs> if you guys uh, missed our last episode, which was the first episode back, uh, make sure you go back and watch it with uh, Yerishe Azarian from mm -hmm. uh, P People of R. It great was a conversation. Great show. Yeah. Great conversation. Um, so we had some difficulties, technical difficulties. We made it work. We did. Yeah, we did. Um, as always, before we, uh, you know, bring on our guest, uh, I want to mention a couple of announcement. Um, everybody in the LA area, this Sunday, October second, the Desire to Live film by Maria Mavetisian will be showing at twelve noon in Glendale uh, at for the Glendale International Film Festival at the Lemley Theater in Glendale. Uh, this film has won one hundred thirty five festival awards. And uh, check this out. The last one was at the East, uh, Istanbul Film Festival. Mm -hmm. How cool is that? Yeah. Well, um, that's a big community there. Yeah. The Desire to Live is a feature documentary detailing the stories of the survivors of the war in 2020 in the Republic of Artsakh. Uh, we're lucky enough to give away 20 tickets to everyone who is joining us tonight or will be listening. Uh, if you are in the LA uh, and surrounding areas and you would like to attend, message us on Instagram with your name and phone number or email us at pod, P-O-D, at medhedosnet.com. If you're not following us on Instagram, uh, make sure it's basically at medhedosnet, very simple. Yeah. Um, it will be the it, it will be first come, first serve, and we're limiting two tickets per person. If you need more, maybe we'll work out a deal, but please only if you're serious because these tickets have been paid for. So we don't want them to go to waste. Yeah. Um, so if you are really interested, please contact us and we'll get you those tickets. Again, this is this Sunday, October 2nd at 12 noon at the Lemley Theater in Glendale. It's a great film. Everybody should go see it. Um, besides that, the other announcement I want to make is um, the No Men Left Behind second annual gala which will take place Friday, October 14th, 14th. at 6.30 p.m. at the Tagalian Cultural Complex. We encourage everybody uh, to support by donating and attending. Basically, when you donate, you get a ticket. Uh, for more information on tickets, questions, if you want to be a sponsor, um, there's sponsorship opportunities, go to cftjustice.org or email info at cft ftjustice.org mm -hmm. a master of ce uh, ceremonies will be alina abovian from yes. ktla 5 news <clears throat> here in the los angeles area so everybody uh, please go support even if you can't make it go donate help this is a great cause they're doing some amazing work yeah. these are a group of lawyers who came together and they are basically going towards the international court uh for the war crimes uh, you know uh, basically yeah. by uh, azerbaijan during the war and still now so that's pretty much it as far as announcement and um, big things going on. Yeah. Uh, thank you to everyone who's joining us again. It's not our typical hour, but the reason we do this is because uh, our guest is from Armenia and he has woken up really early the, to join the, us. The, the wizard says hello from. Oh, Edinburgh. yeah. There you go. I had had hey, <laughs> um, so uh, Ruben Galician is an independent London based scholar and researcher specializing in historical maps of Armenia and the South Caucasus region. He has uh, published many books and articles on the history of cartography of the Caucasus. His first book entitled Historic Maps of Armenia, the Cartography Heritage in 2000, 2004 which presents a collection of world maps and maps of the Caucasus over a period of 2,600 years. Became a bestseller in 2005. His articles have uh, appeared in various uh, cartography magazines, journals, and uh, um, basically one of them is Imago Mundi and the IMCOS journal. 
He has lectured extensively, extensively in Armenia, USA, Iran, and UK and France. So everybody, welcome Ruben Galician. Hello, Ruben. Hi, Ruben. Hello. Good morning. How are you today, sir? Good morning to you. Good evening to you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, we're, a li- we're a little behind, as usual. Um, we want to thank you for taking the time to join us uh, today. Um, we, you know, as we cover so many historical events and periods uh, with our podcast, uh, we find it fit that someone like yourself should uh, teach us about yes. the historical maps because when we talk about these these uh, eras and and the stories we tell it's hard for people to visualize, to visualize yeah. where all this is happening especially armenia historically being the theater of war for many other um you know <laughs> empires yes. so uh it, it's a privilege to have you on our show and we, we are grateful and thankful so thank you for inviting me to the show uh, first of all, I'm not going to lecture anybody about anything. I'm going to share the knowledge that I have with yeah. others who participate in this meeting. So uh, perhaps I should say a few words about myself. Yeah, I, I, I was sure. actually going to ask you if you can introduce to people who might not know about you, uh, where where you were born, where you grew up, uh, and most uh, I think especially how you got into cartography, yeah. like what, what made you get into this field? Uh, well, uh, I was born in the city of Tabriz in northwestern Iran. Uh, when I went, we moved out from the Tabriz when I was 12 years old, we moved to Tehran and I did my schooling there. Uh, when I finished school, I had a scholarship from the oil company to study in England. So I went to England and graduated from Aston University in Birmingham in electronics engineering, which has nothing to do with cartography. Yeah. But uh, from my childhood, I was interested in maps. And I remember uh, during the last days of the World War II, on my our wall, there was a large map of Europe and Asia and North Africa. My father used to follow the front line, what's happening, et cetera, putting some pins on the map. And I used to sit down and copy that map on a piece of paper. So it started from there, and the geography was one of my top interesting sub- interest subjects in the in the school. Uh, I used to continue. I used to continue copying maps of different sorts. We had a 19th century German atlas. So I used to, used to copy maps from there. Uh, anyway, even until uh, I came uh, returned to Iran and worked in Iran for 15 years. When after the Iranian revolution, after a year of, and after the revolution, I was invited to work in, uh, in a British company in England. I went there uh, temporarily for about six months, but war started Iran, Iraq, and we stayed there for 35 years, 30 years. Wow. wow. Anyway, during that time, I had the chance of uh, seeing old maps from up close. The British Library, which, which was a, a member of, uh, has four million maps, so you can imagine the uh, time spent. I was I used to spend my uh, few, three four days a week in the British Library studying all these maps. Now, now did you get to yeah. see all four million of them? Um, <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. <laughs> A few, I saw a few thousand. <laughs> a few thousand. Okay. Wow. <laughs> So anyway, uh, until my friend of mine, we were talking about uh, maps, etc. I said, look at the maps that I was showing him. He said, they're very nice. Why don't you publish something? So in, 19, uh, in 2001, we, there was a calendar published in, by a bank in Armenia, which had 12 of these maps on it, which were, looked very uh, beautiful because their old yeah. maps were, were works of art, most of them. Yeah. Anyway, it took from there, and then when I started reading about Azerbaijan's uh, claims on Armenian land, etc., and I started, I, I thought that I should publish a book about the historic maps of Armenia, because when you publish about the historic maps of Armenia for for 2,600 years in the region, you see there is no Azerbaijan north of Arax River ever until 1918. Yeah. So uh, this book was the beginning of my work. 
So from then on, I have continued, and the ninth book was recently published. Uh, and uh, my books are published. I write it first in English, translated to Armenian, then some are trans have been translated to Russian, three in Persian, one even in Turkish, historic maps of Armenia. Uh, a bridge oh, which, wow. which uh, version was published in uh, Istanbul uh, three years ago. Wow, that's amazing! So, that's amazing. In the 1970s, when I was working in Iran, I started getting interested in old maps and getting old uh, versions. I used to come to England to participate in auctions, and there started my collection of old maps, uh, which over 300 maps and atlases oldest dating from the 15th century, uh, which I donated a few years back to Matena Darani in Yerevan, so that yeah. everybody could access to it. Oh, okay. This is wow. the history of my interest in maps, and naturally when I uh, study, when you want, you want to study maps, you want to study old geography, and in, in the old days, geography, history were one subject, referred in, in each book contained details about geography and history of the... And history, area. yeah. Like so hand in hand. I was dug into the history as well. I'm not a historian, but I'm aware of the history of particularly Southern Caucasus, what was ha has been happening, and particularly now, now in, in after the 1918 independence of these three countries. Mm -hmm. there. Yeah. So, well, I mean, w w when you're when you're dealing with maps and studying m maps, especially going one back, must I mean, understand. It's, it, you're automatically yeah. going to learn yes. history. So. Yeah. Um, you know, not all hist historians, I mean, we've come across people who are not historians, but the wealth of knowledge they have by just the research they've done is amazing. So I don't Ruben, I'm sure I'm sure you've been asked um, how certain borders have changed or what events may have led to certain borders being shifted and moved, you know, so yeah. you have to have like a firm understanding to an extent, maybe yeah. not as much as a real historian, but to answer some of these questions, I'm sure. Yeah. Of course I have. This, uh, today yeah. in this presentation, I will first refer to Armenia, and his, in, in, historically speaking, the region of Armenia in old mm -hmm. maps, up to the 1918. And from 1918 onwards, the part, second part of the talk would be about the Armenian republics of Armenia, and the borders, and how they have changed, why they have changed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This All right. Well... Topic. I, I know you shared some uh, slides with us, which we'll bring on the screen yeah. to kind of for you to to present uh, your your knowledge and everything you know about these maps, going all the way back to, to pretty much the beginning, mm -hmm. as early as you know uh, anything that was mentioned as far as Armenia. Um, you know, uh, since we're on this topic, good question would be: is where do you find or where did or where was found, let's say, the first evidence of Armenian or people of Armenia on any sort of map? If you, uh, if, if, if your research or studies have gone back this far. Yes, uh, I, I have gone back as far as possible. And the first yeah. real mentioned, inscribed mention about Armenia mm -hmm. is on the first slide. Yep. Okay. Okay. On the bottom left, you can see the Behistun inscriptions in Iran near Kirmansha and this is a inscription in cuneiform inscription in three languages Elamite uh, Old Persian and Babylonian mm -hmm. and the size wow. of this inscription is 25 meters wide and 15 meters high and it's inscribed on a rock face 100 meters above the ground level so it's hardly accessible to anyone therefore it's had been preserved mostly except for the weather damage. Uh, anyway, it says here, the, this is right uh, inscribed by Darius the Great, Iranian King of Kings. And uh, he says, uh, he writes about the, his conquered territories, his relationships with neighbors, etc. And uh, in one part, he refers to the history of 521 BC, writing that in the neighboring Armenia, there were some problems, and I sent my general the armenian general dadarshi to oversee to see what's happening uh, this is written in three languages as i said in elamite it says the country name of the country is referred to is harmonia mm -hmm. in persian it is armenia which is still used today and in yeah. babylonian language it says urartu yep. so 
these three terms are the synonyms. Like in Germany, the French say it, Aleman, the Germans say themselves, say Deutschland, we say Germany. It's yeah. referred to the same country. Therefore, Urartu, when it refers to Urartu, it means Armenia. Uh, on the next slide, if you can see, this is the oldest existing world map. This is a small clay tablet yeah. found in Babylon, from Babylon, uh, about uh, five inches by three and a half inches. And it says, the circle there shows the center of the world. And in there, there are some cities and three countries. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. On the right-hand side, it's the transcription of the German specialist of the text on this that map, on the circular map. In the center, there are three countries mentioned, Babylon, Assyria, and Armenia. This dates from 6th century BC. Incredible. Um, when, when I found this map, I immediately started thinking of when um, somebody that doesn't know any about, anything about Armenia or Armenians asked us, how can you describe your country? What's the quickest sen one sentence? So we always, almost always refer to saying, I answer that saying that uh, we were the first country that accepted Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. But if the questioner is a Jew, is a Hindu, is a Chinese, is a Muslim, what does he care if we're the first or the last country to access That's Christianity? Good point. It's exactly. a very our, good point. Our claim should be. We are one of the three countries appearing in the center of the world on the oldest world map, and the other two do not exist anymore. Yeah, this is this is the only map that like, this yeah. is. There's nothing before this, right? This is the sure. oldest it's map ever. Nothing so far map um, um, map found uh, older than this. There are some maps that refer local small areas of the Nile land, plots of land, etc. But as a map, worldwide map, large map, center of the world, this is the oldest that exists, and it's in, okay. it's in the British Museum. Okay. Wow. Um, so if you go to the next slide, we go to about 450 BC. This is a map called the Herodotus, the inscriptions of Herodotus. And Herodotus mm -hmm. wrote, wrote a history Mm -hmm. And he is considered as the forefather of the historians, his historiography. Yeah. And in there, he refers a number of places to Armenia and the, the two countries that I've underlined red. One, the top is Armenia, and the below is uh, uh, Persia, Parthia. These are the two countries that appear on this map and still exist today, which will be proven on the next slide that we can see from close by. Yes. See, this is the region that Armenia existed, Asia Minor, which is today partially Turkey and etc. And there are many countries, Mesopotamia, Assyria, Media, Armenia, Cappadocia, Phrygia, Pugia, Lydia, Ludia, etc. etc. From all these countries, only two exist today. Armenia and Media, which is part of the Persian Empire. Persian. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. The others have disappeared, leaving only stone monuments, etc. On the next slide, if you go to the next one, it shows the area as it stands today. Today. Yeah. On the left is Turkey, which first time in the map appeared in the 14th, 15th centuries. That's 2,000 years after the name of Armenia appeared on the map. And the north is Georgia, today's Georgia. Georgia mm -hmm. existed long before as a part of Iberia, etc. Mm -hmm. But there were different kingdoms, Kakhetia, Migrelia, Iberia, Kapkazia, etc. Which during the 11th century came together and formed the country as we know as Georgia today. So it go back a long way, but as a unified country, it was... Uh, 11th century. There, are, it lives with the bottom at the bottom with Iran, Islamic Republic of Iran today, and the yellow center in the center, Armenia, which 
have appeared on maps for continuously for 2,600 years. On our right in the east is the Republic of Azerbaijan, which first time on maps appeared in 1918. Mm -hmm. So some of the brandies sold in the old brandies sold in the shops in Armenia are older than Azerbaijan. <laughs> we have so many jokes as far as how old Azerbaijan is. <laughs> Anyway, but they claim to be a country which is 3,000 years old and they do, do they come up with all sorts of inventions, etc., to prove that. Yeah, yeah, so we've continue. seen them all. All right. We've heard about the Tigranes the Great, Tigranes and Tigran, about the king of Armenia just before our era that occupied from sea to sea. Here in the center, in the yellow, is the kingdom that Tigran conquered. It extends from the Caspian to the Mediterranean Sea, includes Lebanon, etc., as parts of Syria, and all the countries around. But uh, it didn't last very long because the Roman Empire was uh, saw Tigran as a threat, and they unified and pushed Tigran back to the historic Armenia, which is yeah. the uh, top part of this uh, yellow area in the region. This was done in the, the, the first century BC, before our era. Yeah, we've uh, talked again, about all mm -hmm. this. Uh, uh, we we did an extensive ep uh, two episodes on on Tigran the Great and everything that happened. So oh, those of you cool. who haven't uh, heard it, go listen to it. It's 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 amazing. It's actually, so. two great episodes to listen to, yeah. guys. Yeah. So next slide. In here, uh, we've heard the Strabo, the founder of geography, yes. and he's got a seventeen volume book called uh, Geographia. In there, he allocates in 60 pages to lesser Armenia and greater Armenians, both historically and geographically. This is a map drawn according to his descriptions, the world map by uh, Strabo. Strabo. Mm. It's according to Strabo, yeah. Now, but when this was this map created? It was created during the 19th century from the writings of Strabo. From the writings, okay. Many historians created maps and according to his writing, and many, most of them are very similar to this. This is done by uh, you know, Charles Miller. Okay. Uh, so interesting. This is the way they viewed. This is the way they viewed the known world at the time. Yeah. yeah. Also, yeah. no, there is no Azerbaijan there mm -hmm. because the name Azerbaijan even didn't appear there until later on. And let's go to the next slide. Now, this is a part of a world map by a Greek geographer and cartographer Ptolemy, Claudius Ptolemaeus, who was heading the Library of Alexandria, in, which was the largest library at the time. Here, on the right, in the center on the right, you see Hyrcanian or Caspian. It means the Caspian Sea, on the left is the Black Sea, and between those two, we see two areas underlined red. Armenia Mayor, the Greater Armenia, and to yeah. its left, to the left of the Euphrates River, Armenia Minor, Lesser Armenia. Yeah. This date from the second century AD, our era, <laughs> this map. It's part of a, uh, it's included in the book of Ptolemaeus, who produced the cold called uh, Cosmographia or Geographia again. And uh, this book contains instructions how to measure land, how to make, uh, draw maps, etc. That includes 8,000 place names in the world, known world there, which didn't include Americas. In the 8,000 names, 170 are dedicated to Armenia. Wow, that's Ooh. fascinating. There's no Azerbaijan there. There's only Caucasian Albania, which area, the area of which are, uh, Azerbaijan Direct. occupies today. Yeah. Here on the, on the right, it, uh, this Albania you can see underlined blue, and the light green underlining, it says media, which is part of the Persian Empire. Yes. Hmm. Next slide. This is a 
a Christian map, one quarter of a Christian map showing the world. The world was shown as a circular uh, flat disk. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the top, the top was East because uh, they said it, it's according to religious dogma in the East and sunrise is from the East and the terrestrial paradise in the East. So Christian maps of the Middle Ages had North, not instead of North at the top, they had East at the top. That's interesting. And where you see on top is named Paradisus, the paradise and the four rivers growing, flowing out of it. On the left of the map, there's an on the area, there's a name underlined, underlined red. It says Armenia, between the uh, Caucasus and Taurus Mountains, which oh, are yeah. green, yeah. green blobs there on the map. And the images that you see are the apostles who traveled to these areas to, to uh, take Christianity to <laughs> different parts of the world. These maps date from the sixth century the 8th century and uh, is made by a, a monk called uh, Beatus de Liba, Libena from a Spanish long monk. Oh. Next so one. Interesting. Here is an Islamic world map. The world is a circular in Islamic cartography. They still use the spheri spherical world not in not the flat disc like in the christian ones and it's from the 10th century the air the, the ground uh, the, the earth is surrounded by the four elements of the uh, greek mythology uh, earth air fire and water yeah. and uh, in the islamic uh, mapping south is taken at the top most of the time here south is at the top and the leap shaped uh, red area on the, uh, on the upper part of what are the mountains of moon where the Nile has its sources from and the sources are shown with the five green lines the sources of nine continuing down and flowing into the Mediterranean um, bottom part there's a, also sea of the, the Black Sea which is uh, at the end of a semi uh, circular line going with a, ending with a white circle in the middle mm -hmm. and the name of armenia is underlined red in the in persian it says armenia south of the black sea near the caucasus here again azerbaijan is not mentioned north of the araks river and again this was 10th century 10th century yes. 10th century yeah the next map is also the Islamic map. This Islamic cartography map, geography contained, uh, in, developed in the school of Balkh. Uh, and it knew normally these books have about 27 maps of, of the various regions of the world and one world map. And the world map you saw on the previous slide. And this is the map of the South Caucasus. It's in Persian. It's again from the 10th century. It's made by Ibn Hawqal, another uh, Muslim cartographer. And the green on the mass on the right is the Caspian Sea. And two uh, lines flowing into it. On the top is the river Kura. On the bottom is the river Araxes. And you see it, the lower part of the map in the uh, it says there is one Azerbaijan south of the Iranian, of the, yeah. the Iraq River, which is yeah. the Iranian province of Azerbaijan. Province, yes. And to its left, there's Armenia with the red masses, two masses next to it. The mount, it's called Mounts Ararat, large and small. The two more than on the north of the Arax River, there is Albania, which is the Caucasian Albania, nothing to do yeah. with present day Albania. Yeah. And these are the generally the way that Islamic maps are presented. Normally, uh, in the world map, on the Islamic maps, there's all countries mentioned. So even from Scythia, which was the old Russia, and going to Europe, to Germany, France, etc. Uh, but on the detailed maps, there's they refer only to Islamic countries. In the um, um, Ibn Masud, in his book, in the beginning, he, when he describes, goes into these detailed maps, he says, uh, we have included only the maps of, of the believers, lands of believers. 
we don't have waste time on the lands of the non-believers, which it means yeah. that we only we are showing Muslim maps. On the but on the Muslim maps, there's one map which is well, this one is the South Caucasus. There's a non-Muslim country, Armenia. Armenia, and it yeah. explains why they have include these maps in their maps in, in their uh, yes, into in the, the screen so they can see us. The reason is that uh, Armenia had close ties with Azerbaijan and Iran, commercial ties. Therefore, we include them in the Islamic country map. Uh, okay. This is very interesting. It goes on describing the cities of Armenia, etc., etc. Wow. Next one. Uh, here uh, is a typical uh, Christian map of the world. Again, circular, flat circle. And these maps are called TO maps. O is the circle with, circle. Uh, with goodness, you know? And the letter T is a water expanses that divide the world into the different continents. The vertical one is the Mediterranean. On the left is the river Don in Russia. On the right is river Nile in Egypt. Above that, half of the map on the top part is Asia with lots of countries. In Europe, on the bottom left, there are also a number of countries. But on the right, Africa was not yet uh, explored. So there's nothing in Africa mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, but in Asia, there are this, this map dates from the time of the Crusades, Crusades, yeah. 11th century, 12th, 12th century. And there are two Armenians mentioned, mentioned there. One is the Greater Armenia, with the light blue uh, uh, pointer at the top. And the other one is next next to the Mediterranean. It's, it's a Cilician Armenia. Armenian Kingdom of Cilicia, which existed yeah. on the shore of the, of the Mediterranean Sea from the 10th to the 14th centuries. Yeah. They, so they this they it's a French map. The French had close ties with the Armenian merchants, yes, therefore they, they showed their maps. Next one. Okay. And this is a map, part of a map made by an Italian Venetian monk called Fra Mauro. And the names that appear in red all say Armenia. On the right, corner right hand corner of the map the little bit of blue you see is the corner of the mediterranean in this map south is at top i forgot to mention the little that is the mediterranean kingdom of armenia and there are one large armenia on the left land of armenia and then regions mm. of armenia on the line red again uh, there is one area underlined blue which is Arka Noe, Noah's Ark. It's a mountain with a <laughs> little house sitting on it. That's the amount uh, Ararat, and the house is the Noah's Ark that sits on top of the Ararat mountains. Wow. Uh, below it, on the left, there's a, a name underlined green, which says Mountains of Karabakh. This is the first time that in any European map the name of Karabakh appears. This is in uh, 1460. 1460, yes. Oh. Again, there's no Azerbaijan. There's also Iran, which is the Persian, Albania, which is the uh, uh, Latin name for the region of the uh, ex Albania. So, 1460, first time Karabakh appeared. Next now, time. Karabakh, is it because it was by the Persians called it? Karabakh, or was it like why was it named Karabakh? Ah, uh, it, the language spoken in the in, in that area we're going sideways. <laughs> Additionally, <laughs> for me. Uh, the language spoken today in the Persian Azerbaijan and in Turkish as the Republic of Azerbaijan is Turkish, but in Iran until the 15th century, 16th century. Iranian Azerbaijan with the Armenians called Atar Patakan, south of the yeah. Arab mm -hmm. yeah. The language spoken was a Pahlavi dialect until the 15th, 16th century. That Pahlavi dialect was the real Azeri language. The one that yeah. the Mr. Uh, Aliyev calls Azeri language 
to the, his country's language. It's not Azeri, it's Turkish that they speak. All Azeri is the old language that existed at the time, but since the region was ruled for a few hundred years by Muslim hordes from uh, Central Asia, etc., who became Muslim later on, and they were speaking a Turkic language, like Karakoyunlu, Akoyunlu, etc., the, the, the population did not, the language spoken by the population was not a written language, it was an oral passed from mouth to mouth. And great gradually during the 15th century, 16th century, they changed their language into the language of the rulers. In other words, this Azeri language was forgotten and was replaced by the Turkish language. Now, in Iran, uh, there are still a few villages that speak the old language, which is, has appeared in the, disappeared about the 16th century. But uh, it is important to note that they prefix kara in today's turkish means black yeah but in old azeri language it meant large karabakh is not a black garden is a large garden the iranian karadakh which is south of the arax river is not a black mountain it's a large mountain uh, the Sante Thaddeus Monas Monastery near northwestern Iran in Uttar Patakan, the locals called it Kara Kilisa, literally today's language, black church. It is constructed of white marble, but it's <laughs> the largest complex, religious complex of the area. Therefore, Kara Kilisa, large church. Karasu wow. is the widest river in Azerbaijan, not black water. Large water. Large water. In Gabriel, yeah. When I was born, I remember there was a tree that five, six people had to hold hands to circle it. It's they said it's about eight hundred years old, seven and hundred years old. They used to call it Kara Agaj. Agaj is in Turkish means tree. Kara, sure. today's Turkish, black. But the untold Turkish large tree. Large, large tree. That's so this is the source of the Karabakh then board. Kara, Karabakh, yeah. large, large garden because it's all green, lush green area. If you've yeah. been there, you've seen it. So they don't even know the real meaning of calling it. No, no. no, but 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 even it's, even uh, Armenians uh, today are still saying that even the word or whatever it like, yeah. means black. Everybody, no, it, like there, there, there's your answer. There's uh, nobody pays any attention to number yeah. of Iranian scholars that have written on the subject that this is Kara is not black it's large nobody pays any attention because it's the name is there wow. already yeah i you mean know, i've heard uh, I've, I've i've heard stories about the reason why it's it was called black because the soil is really rich and dark and and all these well you, anecdotes i guess yeah the, the, an, the an, anecdotes exactly yeah. they, they are anecdotes because well okay but karasu water cannot be black can it no so it's large water not black water yeah and also the black sea you know what uh, the old latin name was mare magnum mare the black sea in no old latin name for it was black um, mare magnum means large sea huh. and it was translated into the black sea by the turks and we continue it and the name yeah. has uh, I mean that, oh, oh, that oh, crossed oh, my mind well, when we were talking we were a little bit I guess ago, but genetically all they see is black so so, <laughs> so it, it, it's called mare magnu magnum magnum okay magnum, Mare Mare Mar yeah magnum yeah okay magnum yeah okay. so interesting so interesting that wow awesome well we just debunked awesome. the whole uh Karabakh thing <laughs> so, so cool that is, so, that's amazing let's go back to maps <laughs> all right so next, next slide uh, here is the well. Uh, sorry, let me go back. I skipped. Um, okay. Here's the oldest uh, globe in existence in the world. On the this is the, made in 1492. Therefore, there is no America on it. It excludes America, but the world is shown as a globe. And uh, on the on the right hand side, the enlarged part of the each circled in red is the Mount Ararat with Noah's Ark on sitting on it. And in what at the bottom says Armenia. This is 1492. Hmm. Christopher Columbus era. 
Yeah, we <laughs> this whole Christmas with Columbus here. Sorry, you don't exist on this one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just hence hence why I did the quotations. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, this is uh, uh, the work of one of the most famous the Dutch cartographers, Abraham Ortelius. In 1595, he drew a, a world, small world map and then enlarged it, a larger scale of a version of it. Uh, but on this one, uh, you see the uh, Antarctica. The Antarctica is mm -hmm. enlarged, covers half of the world. Yeah, Alaska literally. Is so huge, so huge that you cannot imagine Alaska. And Australia doesn't exist yet. It wasn't discovered yet. So uh, the details of the uh, region of the Caucasus are enlarged at the bottom right. There, between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, you see Armenia. And wow. below, right in the green area, you see Persia. And below Armenia, between and, and the two left, there is a Soria, which is Syria. Syria. Yeah. And region of Turkey is called Anatolia. Anatolia was Anatolia. the name of the peninsula given by the mm -hmm. Byzantine Greeks, the Byzantines. So there's no Turkey there even. So uh, there's, in addition to the name Armenia, there are a number of cities, etc., Iranian cities and uh, Middle Eastern cities, but there's no Azerbaijan, there's nothing of, of the sort. And so this, Armenia, is, this is 16th century. Yeah, end of 16th century. Yeah. I'd Next love one. to ask you some non-Armenian yeah. related questions, but not not now. It'll go off on a tangent, but maybe maybe later. Yeah, well, sure. Go on. Next one. Uh, you see, we know that Armenia as an like independent Caspian. country did not exist for about 600 years or so. Mm -hmm. And this is the map that's done during that time, 1718, the beginning of the 18th century. The Persian Empire in, uh, in uh, yellow, Ottoman Empire in pink, etc., and the Russian Empire in red on the top. The name of Armenia appears beginning from the Ottoman Empire, Armenia Mayor. You can Mayor. see in the center of the map, Greater Armenia. It appears on the maps. Why? In the old days, before the 15th century, there were no borders generally shown on maps. And the areas that the maps showed were named with the names of the people who lived in it. For instance, region of Ar where Armenian lives was named Armenia, where the Persians lived was Parthia or Persia or Media, when the the uh, wherever the Assyrians live was what Assyria, etc. Here it indicates the name existing of name extending over Ottoman, the Persian, and the Russian empires means that the Armenians live here. Honor Ruman, I have a I have a question concerning this. Now back then, back then, let's say as things kind of advanced in let's say the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century, as we're seeing now, cartographers, yeah. cartographers how did they determine i mean, like you just said the people who populated a particular area but how did they determine let's say these border lines on the maps was it based off of geographic um like landmarks ranges or something like or that? rivers as we know yeah. typically happens or were, did they have did they physically go see it or did they have people who had physically seen a some sort of separation i know it sounds a little bit of a childish question but i've no, always no, wondered it is a childish at all. It's, you're quite right. Uh, some of the geographers, old-time geographers, Ptolemy, yeah. for instance, traveled widely in the Middle East, mm -hmm. but not all, not all over the world. Uh, other geographers, like uh, 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 Arab uh, Fada, he traveled all over the Middle East. He produced maps, etc. And in Europe, map makers were basing their information on travelers or merchants that traveled from China to, uh, to Europe, etc., describing on the way and after one day's travel, we reached from that city to the other city, etc. Oh, so right. interesting. So, so they were the GPS, they were like the human GPS yeah, system of today. Yeah. yeah. All information on maps was based on that. Therefore, wow. one 
after one was original map was made, then there's somebody has traveled somewhere that you uh, extended the, his, their travels. So they added that information on the existing maps. Next, so my cool. cartographer added the information. Therefore, mm. here you see, for instance, the Caspian Sea. Mm -hmm. It's almost circular. It's the wrong shape. Yeah, it's t completely the wrong shape in comparison to well, today's maps. Short, yeah, the wrong shape continued until 1730 because nobody had traveled around the Cas whole, whole of the Caspian to find out what it looks like. Yeah, and wow. then, the then, Google cars back then didn't get <laughs> reached there. <laughs> and then in 1720s, uh, Peter the Great called the uh, French cartographers to go and uh, uh, draw the map of the Caspian Sea. And from yeah. then on, we have the real map of the Caspian Sea. Mm -hmm. So this is oh. maps are updated, corrected, uh, inf additional information included over the thousands and thousands of years. That's so cool. That's so interesting that yeah, in 1718 really they still hadn't gone to the upper side of the Caspian Sea to yeah. kind of. They had, wow. but but they, they know they had traveled all around it to find out what it looks like. Yeah. Uh, one, one important uh, travel uh, map source was the uh, in the Mediterranean at least was where the local fishermen and local traders would travel from port to port. In the old maps, there is a called more Portoland maps, in other words, seafaring maps. You see all the details on the coast, but nothing inland. So the Mediterranean was drawn in detail from the beginning of era by Greek travelers, the Greek uh, uh, captains of the uh, ships that traveled the area. They, they did make their own maps because it was important for them to find out where the river ends and where are the obstacles under the, under the sea, uh, etc. And though, though those, though those maps are the most detailed for the Mediterranean. I think I have one or two in this presentation of no Portland maps. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is it is very important to gather information from the travelers and put it on paper. Yeah, it's so interesting. I'm I'm very okay. interesting. How many yeah. people they must they must have talked to? You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, because I mean, it's such a big trade route. It was one of the greatest trade routes in world history. So imagine yeah. all the information you're getting from so many yeah. different people and different and cultures too. Think about and it. When, and when the larger travelers started going to the Far East for the spices, etc., the Dutch yeah. one, the Dutch yeah. one started that, they drew their maps. And those maps, particularly in Barcelona, in um, Catalonia, etc., those mm -hmm. maps that they were drawn by the Portuguese and the, by the Dutch were so secret that they recopied, the, the map was kept in the king's treasury. Wow. And only a copy was given for it to a captain that had to travel I, that place. I was about to say this had to have do, had to do with shipping because we know oh, the yeah. Portuguese the Spaniards and the Dutch were yeah. big big yeah. big yeah. Or, you know their armadas yeah. their 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 fleets were massive yeah. Great according point. to yeah. Yeah. according to uh, mainstream history you know yeah they they prepared maps and the maps on yeah. the ship was kept in the captain's cabin in a sp special wooden box that had lead in it so that when <laughs> it was the pirates uh, conquered, conquered the ship, the captain had to, tr to throw it in the water so that it would sink to the bottom. Oh my the God, that's amazing. Oh, they because thought, they of, they thought of how to pr preserve it, basically. How to roots roots booby trapped it. Yeah. Trade routes were secret. Nobody would yeah. know about it. It was yeah. a competition. It's amazing. These, are, these yeah. are different stories related to maps. That's port, so cool. Port, port, port. Anyway, let's right. continue. Okay, next next slide. Yeah. All right. Oh, you see, I mentioned the Caspian Sea shape of the Caspian yeah. Sea. Yeah. It's, it's a completely changed. It is the real shape now. Yeah. Shift seventeen thirty one. The map was drawn by the French during seventeen thirty one. The pink area is called Shirvan, the region that the Azerbaijan, Republic of Azerbaijan is now. And it has different Khanets, Persian Muslim Khanets in it. The one underlined red is Armenia. Again, not independent country, but Armenians yeah. live in this land. A region. Yeah. yeah, occupied region. Below that, there are two lakes shown. 
One is like Urmia, the other is like Van. Uh, the shapes of the lake are not correct. And the cartographer has heard that both of these lakes have salty water. Therefore, he has thought that they must be connected with the river to each other. Oh, One of them is okay. 100 kilometers apart, <laughs> in effect. <laughs> Misinformation. But above those, underlined in light blue, this is Atropaten, Azerbaijan. Atropaten, Azer, Atropaten was the name of the country in the old days and which gradually changed to Azerbaijan. Yeah, we've, we've, talked, we've mentioned Atropaten a lot. South, south of the Arax River. Now let's go back to the name Azerbaijan, Atropaten, etc. Yeah. That region, south, north, and northeast, northwestern part of Iran, used to be called Lesser Media. Media is the name of the Median Kingdom. Lesser Media looks smaller part of Media. During the attacks of the other Alexander the Great, the local general Atro, Atropat defended the region, and Alexander the Great couldn't manage to con con conquer Media. He didn't conquer media. He bypassed it. After the death of Alexander, the, the, uh, uh, of the uh, Atropat, after 200 years, the people of Atropat and uh, the region, lesser media, decided to call their country with the name of the hero that had, had protected them, Atropat. The name was mm -hmm. give, given during the first century, second century, it was Atropat, the uh, uh, Atropaten, the land of Atropat. You know, Armenia was still used that name, Atar Patakan. Atar Patakan, yeah. But but when the Arab conquered the region, you know, the Arabs, there's the the, mm -hmm. the, the, the different letters don't exist. They are interchangeable yes. with others. So Atar Atropaten Atropat, became Atropagen, Atarbagen, Atarbigan, Atarbijan, Azerbaijan. Evolved. Because of the language, yeah. the name, name Azerbaijan, name Azerbaijan, comes from the origin, original Atropat. Atropat, yeah. Atropat, which actually sounds better, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, when uh, in 1918 the newly found Republic, a Muslim Republic, called itself Azerbaijan, the Iranian government complained that this is uh, the land, of part name of our province. This should not be called. We were, you were aware of that, and you, the name should not be. Uh, it should not belong yes. there. Yes, yes, I actually power, mentioned that. Yeah, but yeah, I mentioned power, that on our last episode. Sorry to cut you off. Is that we we mentioned this because we we've ta we were talking about about the Urartu, and again somehow mm -hmm. we ended up. Uh, they 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 petitioned. Yeah, they to did. them saying yeah, like, did. "What are you guys doing here? Like, you can't just take our name and create yeah. a new country." And now and now they're trying. Well, if, if if it serves me correctly, I think they're trying to. Not petition, but they're trying to regain the lands, the the province. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. In uh, the Republic of Azerbaijan, has a TV uh, station, a number of radio stations beamed to Iranian side, saying, "You are our brothers. You should come and join us. Leave Iran and join us." <laughs> in 1946, after the Second World War, in Iranian Azerbaijan, the communists, the Russians, organized a new party called. Democratic Party, and that Democratic Party, after the end of the World War II, was planning to be annexed with uh, Soviet Azerbaijan. Fortunately, the Iranian government found out about these tricks, and they, they stopped them, Good. pushing the Russians out. And it was diplomacy, not power, not, not uh, <clears throat> uh, by force that the Russians left the area. The local, the prime minister at the time, Rauma Saltaneh, uh, promised Russians uh, all the oil in the Atropaten, in Iranian Azerbaijan, to be given to Russian control, to be left, to be uh, under Russian control. And he persuaded Russians to leave so that he can take this to the parliament. Uh, the Russians left. And he took it to the parliament and advised his own countrymen, uh, his own colleagues, to vote against it. So, end of day, that proposal didn't pass the Majlis, Iranian Majlis parliament. And Ravon said, well, I did my best, but the people didn't accept it. So, what can I do? 
So that's what how the Soviets left so Iranian Azerbaijan in 1947, <laughs> year after the war. Wow. That's and they're, and they're and they're still trying. Yeah. They're and they're still, still trying. trying. Yeah, and well, they're still trying. Yeah, they're still trying. Ali, Ali, why do you think uh, Aliyev has signed an um, agreement with the Iranian to, to have a direct route from through Azerbaijan to yeah. Iran and the Iranian Royal mm -hmm. Railways south of the, the, the Persian Gulf? Yeah, they have built their own railways up to the point that the, Iran hasn't done anything regarding what hundred miles that Iran has to construct. Because Azerbaijan is not a reliable partner. Azerbaijan on one side says we're partners, we want to trade together. On the other side, he says that the province, your northwestern province is ours, should belong to us. This is the reason. I mean, they're a persistent bunch. I mean, they it's claim it's everything, not, right and left. It's not a matter of persistence. It just it uh, seems well, like... It's like the well, I mean, it is a brainless they, spoiled. It's like the brainless um, spoiled um, child that just doesn't understand any logic whatsoever. They just keep going mm -hmm. with I'll with falsified information. A little more detail about that later on. Yeah, yeah. Let's okay. Go and let's continue. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is the map of the war in 1877 between Russia and the Ottoman Empire. It's an Ottoman map made in on Turkey, Ottoman Turkey. And the, the translations with the, the names are in Turkey, the translations are done it in, in, in red. For instance, the Ottoman Empire from the extends from Greece to the uh, Arab, Arab Peninsula. But yeah. Anatolia, if you see in the middle there, mm -hmm. that Anatolia refers to the only the peninsula, the part that sticks had, is between yeah. the two seas. Which is was the name like that all the time. Now, Anatolia, in order, and let no, no, let's go back to the map. On the map, you see, it's from one mush to Karabakh, it says Armenia. Mm -hmm. That's a Turkish map. And south of uh, Lake Van, near the, the south of the Arbekir, it says Kurdistan. Kurdistan. And Iran, on the name Iran, just above a little, I haven't underlined it, but it says Azerbaijan inside Iran. And where Baku is, it says Shirvan. Little yeah. letter. And, and, so and, this, and this is 1877. I mean, it's not that, it's not that long ago, no. Yeah. no. The Turks said there is no Azerbaijan north of Arab it's, it's right before. It's right before the pogroms. Yeah. 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 Right before the pogroms. 20 years before that started. Yeah. Pogrom, yeah. 15 years, yeah. So now, in order to remove that name Armenia from their own land, Turks have started calling the whole of their country Anatolia. From Aegean Sea to Iranian border. By the way, Anatolia means east in, in, in Greek. When the really? Byzantine Empire was founded in Constantinople, they occupied the um, peninsula they conquered the peninsula, and they called it Anatolia, Eastern Territories. Yeah, for Greek, the East. And when, in the beginning, when the Turks wanted to change the name and remove the name of Armenia from Armenian highlands, they called the region east of eastern part of Turkey Doğu Anadolu. Doğu in Turkish means East. Anatolia in Greek means East. In other words, this name became so, East of East. E east of, of East, yeah. Yeah. Which later and then the, the Azerbaijani called it East of East, east of, of East. east. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is the games they play on the changing name. Yeah. So the name of Armenian Highland doesn't appear in Turkey. It says Anatolian Highland. No, why would it? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's go. Let's continue. Right. Next slide. Now, uh, it's a political thing, this one. Uh, mm -hmm. During the 19th century, the pan-Turkist movement was mm -hmm. uh, began in Russia, in, in the, mainly in Russia and Kazakhstan area and Tataristan, what they called it. Uh, it meant it, the, the, the purpose was to join Turkic-speaking countries, which here are shown in yellow, together and form a belt of Turkish-speaking countries. Yeah, yeah. That was the aim. 
Now, if we look at the eastern part of Turkey, there's an area pink, mm. which was mainly populated by Armenians and Assyrians and the Greeks. So during the 1915 genocide, Turkey cleansed them, cleared that, and that obstacle of rem was removed. However, the red part, Armenia still exists. It's blocking the continuation of the pan-Turkic countries. So this, this is almost, the almost, were... almost like the cornerstone, I guess. Yeah, it is a cornerstone. Because Iran wouldn't allow them to include Iranian and Azerbaijan in their land. So Armenia is the blocking the in the middle like a wedge it's stuck in the belt, cutting it into two. This is the reason that those genocides were perpetrated. This is the reason that Azerbaijan want, wants to have the Sunik corridor. Yeah. To make a road connecting the east and west of the Turkey speaking countries. Yeah, it's speaking politically. And the it's, it starts. Gray Wolves, and the leader of the Grey Wolves movement, which has began in 1968 in Turkey and follows this dream, was presented Mr. Erdogan last October with this map saying this is our aim to have, to, get, yeah. to achieve. And yeah, we saw that. We saw those posts. Yeah, you, you yeah. saw the presentation to Mr. Erdogan. Anyway, let's continue and go back. Come, come back to the beginning of our era. Now, uh, when I spoke about the genocide, you see the areas that yeah. it was perpetrated with yellow, so that to cleanse the Armenians, so that the belt will be can be continued. Next one. Okay. Now, Armenia, the region of Armenia was formed in 1917 before the Republic, and it covered this, uh, uh, it was called the Armenian Commission, the, the local commission was it called. Was, it, it included all these maps, including those with um, circles with green, blue, and yellow. This was Armenia, supposed to be Armenia, 1917-18. Next one. Now, uh, before we go to the next one, when you yeah. say this is okay. supposed to be Armenia, was this base? Who, who, it was, who was it? It was began, it was, it, it began like this. By but, whom? So, By, but in 1920, this green area, the area of the circle by green, was given to Turkey as a present by Lenin. Yeah, the yeah, the, the, cars, the, 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 the cars, right? The, 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 the cars. Cars and Moscow agreements. They, yeah. they, they gave it to many. They just hand but it over. My my question was: w w This map, but as we're looking at it, was it uh, formed by, like, say, the League of Nations or or some kind of like, the U.S.? Because I know there's also the Wilsonian map that is always out there. You know, we've had episodes about that as well. Yeah, uh, this map was made by the by historians who studying the history came to this conclusion that this was the area that was under, uh, under Armenian control in 1917, beginning of 1918. Yeah. Okay. But it didn't last long. It didn't last okay. long at no, all. No, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we know it didn't okay. last so long. Let's go okay. to the next map, which was the... Yeah. Here, those two areas. Underline... Yeah. Nachichevan yep. and the mountainous Karabakh. In 19, July of 1921, Stalin decided to give it to Turkey, to Azerbaijan. In, in October of, in November of 30, 19, 1920, when Armenia became uh, communist, all the, the these disputed territories, these territories were disputed. Azerbaijani parliament decided that these disputed territories should belong to Armenia because they have mainly Armenian population and be included in the region of Armenia, in the Soviet Armenia. Uh, Wait, Stalin, this is the Azerbaijani no, parliament? Yeah, Azerbaijani, which is in... Yeah, Azerbaijani. It was what? announced in the newspapers, etc., in Moscow, in Baku, in Yerevan. In my invention of history, the copies of the letters and other announcements are, can be seen. And then uh, it, that was November 30th, 1920. In July of 1921, Stalin went to Baku, and approved this decision first, and the, 
evening of the 4th of July, had a closed door meetings with the Caucasian Bureau members. And the next morning announced that these territories should go, should belong to Azerbaijan, not Armenia. This is the beginning of all the troubles. Stalin's decision on the 5th of July, 1921. Man, don't I wish I was a fly on the and, wall during that. And when it says mountainous Karabakh, it isn't only today's Artsakh. It includes Kashata, mm -hmm. Lachin, and parts of Zangezur. Eastern yeah. Zangezur. All these were given to Azerbaijan. By a decision of Stalin made on the 4th of July, announced on 5th of July, 1921. God, I mean, I mean, not that I want to get involved in the politics of it, but I, I'm, I'm looking at this map right now makes me wonder the conversations that were had between Iran, Azerbaijan, the Soviet Union at the time, right? Because mm -hmm. look, Sunik separates Nakhichevan and mountainous Karabakh. Yeah. So why wouldn't, I, it's just a question, a hypothetical question. Why wouldn't Stalin let Azerbaijan connect all the way through? What did Iran have to do with it? What did the Soviet Union have to do with it? Trade route, whatnot. Just questions. Yeah. I I don't know well, the full I think answers. Nezhde had something to do. Yeah, with yeah, that yeah. Too. Yes, that. Besides that, but think about the four or five different directions of that piece of land. Yeah, that could have swayed things. Let's say we're we're talking what over a hundred years. Well, I'm sure yeah. Iran still didn't want their lifeline to be absolutely cut off. But so. again, think about the political nature of the conversations. Yeah, that was going the you jostling see, that yeah. was going on. Yeah, you, know what you I mean? see it, uh, we uh, we always uh, come late to things. Yeah. We, we, yeah. In hindsight, in hindsight. Hindsight, it's, yep. it should have done something. Should have done. Should have been done. But the thing is that Nakhichevan, the one at the bottom mm -hmm. part of it, Nakhichevan, in the Treaty of Kars and Moscow, has yep. been given the guarantee of not going to be uh, transferred to another country except with the agreement of turkey yeah so this is a little things that are, are, are reflect in the um, agreements agreement yeah, elena, that elena was talking Armenia about that. Has, has not still ratified therefore turkey is, was trying to get armenia ratified the treaty of cars and moscow a few years back when there was an agreement that did that, 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 that uh, we could come back, back, come together, and the football democracy, uh, pol pol politics, football mm -hmm. politics, <laughs> didn't work out because Armenia extended that we're not going to sign it yet. Now, is it true that the Treaty of Kars expires next year, twenty twenty three? No, there's no, expires, no. There's no expiration date, expiry date on the treaty. Yeah, well. No, I, th I thought that the, 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 car, the cars area that was given, it was only for like a hundred years or something like that. Or, I mean, I, I can't imagine no, there being like, know, a statute, of like a statute of limitations or something like this. On. The agreement with, through, through that, there's no time limit. There's no yeah. time limit. All right. Yeah, but like what would, be, what would be resolved or what would but, change? Uh, but like many other governments, when they come to power, we should be dis we we're disregard of the previous agreements. They could announce. Yeah, that. that's true. That's, that's that. true. It all depends okay. on the regime. Uh, yeah, to, but, all of, uh, to, yeah. to all of us, uh, all of you who are joining us live, uh, we see your comments. We see your questions. After later on, after the yeah, we'll, uh, presentation, we'll, present them. We'll, we'll we'll definitely ask your questions uh, to uh, Baron Ruben. Um, okay, next map. Now. Uh, the Soviet Union, when it was formed, they started uh, drawing maps of their republics. Uh, and uh, in 1920 to 23, the Soviet staff, general staff, produced detailed maps of the regions of uh, for Soviet of the various republics, including Armenia and Azerbaijan. Those maps are kept in Moscow, and has Armenians have never seen those maps. In other words, they've done the border maps for Armenia, but we haven't seen it. And Mr. Putin last October announced that during the uh, delimitation and, and uh, 
demarcation. Yeah. Demarcation comes like, yeah, they will have mission demarcation, the discussions and, and meetings. Russia, together with uh, Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia, Russia should also be present because we have maps that nobody else has, referring to this 1920s map, which they haven't given neither to us nor to Azerbaijanis. Now, in 1926, this map appeared in the first Soviet great encyclopedia. And also, map of Azerbaijan appeared there as well. This map is underneath, it says it is approved by NKV, NKVD, Internal Security. And in Soviet Union, if you want to print a map, you have to have the approval of various ministries to print that. I'm sure. This has appeared, therefore, my deduction is that this map is based on the 19, earlier 1920-23 maps that Soviet general staff has produced. And this is the map of Armenia. Here, Armenia has 31,000 square kilometers area. If you see the blue arrow on the mm -hmm. right is Artakh. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You have a common border. Yeah. Which was uh, river Agavnu runs through it. That that common border divides. Yeah. Well, yeah Only it's like a four-way split. The, the bit on the right side of the river was taken up by Azerbaijan in order to cut Armenia from Artsakh. Those yellow areas marked on the map were later on, due to different reasons, given to Azerbaijan. Now, are these the enclaves they keep mentioning? Yeah, the, the, the enclaves are not they are not here on this map. On these maps. On any map until 1936, there were no enclaves. They appeared between 19, some appeared in 1936, and the last one, Tigranashen, 1940. I think I've got some images of those as well. Now, this map shows that Armenian territory was 31,000 square kilometers. There is no enclave in Armenia. This is the basis. This map has the basis has the in the Soviet military maps. Therefore, we should aim today to end up with, uh, with borders which this map shows. We should aim in our yeah. delimitation and demarcation discussions. Yeah. But we have to start from somewhere. Next map. No. I, I, uh, I mentioned that due to the various reasons some pieces of land were given to azerbaijan yeah. now this yeah. red one between Artsakh and armenia is a region that azerbaijan announced that he's going to form a new province called red kurdistan they announced it 1923 they started working on it but they said we want to bring all the kurds living in azerbaijan to this area so that they will be together in Red Kurdistan. But the thing is that they have, uh, uh, they keep sheep and they're not enough grazing land for the sheep in this mountainous region. Therefore, in various decisions of this Caucasian Bureau, etc., pieces of land, grazing land, fields, forests, etc., from Armenia were taken, given to Azerbaijan for Red Kurdistan province. However, in 1933, yeah. the formation of this province was annulled. In other words, it didn't happen. But the lands allocated for this region, for the reason of Kurds living there, were not returned to the original owners, Armenians, but they were taken up by Azerbaijan. Makes you wonder. I mean, it, it must have been. This is a this is ploy. something that has to the international. Yeah. To, to take to international court of justice. You well, you took these pieces of land for a yeah. purpose which didn't exist. Yeah, yeah. Didn't, that wasn't realized. Therefore, it should be back to us. And furthermore, the Azerbaijani uh, constitution says, and Article Two. It says Azerbaijan, Republic of Azerbaijan, 
is the heir of the 1918-1920 Republic of Independent Azerbaijan. We do not recognize any or Soviet borders, right? Yeah. In 1920-1920, there was on the maps of the, the, the region there was no enclave. Therefore, if Azerbaijan Azerbaijan claims an enclave, it goes against its own constitution. And these areas were given to them by the Soviets. Since they were given by the Soviets, you do not accept Soviet rules. You should give, give them back to Armenia as well. These are legal points, international law should take away. There are lots of things to be studied in the mm -hmm. archives to achieve to this end. It's um, a lengthy road. Well, Ruben, um, I want to ask you a question in terms of this. Is there anything, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, have there been any attempts in trying to, besides the obvious that we know of, legally, any attempts at trying to take these lands back, the one highlighted in red? Legal yes, attempts. Yes. We, we have done what, the, what we shouldn't have. Yeah. During the time that we had occupied, as, as they say, liberated those areas mm -hmm. after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we could do something. We should have done something to take back the land because of this reasoning. Legally. They, le legally. We should yes. have applied. We should, take, we should have referred to the International Court, saying legally that belongs to us with these parts of us. We have not done anything during the... 25 years after the Soviet Union, after independence, we have not done anything in trying to keep these Armenian lands, Armenian borders, mm -hmm. bring them back to, to whatever they originally were, and neither we did anything militarily to enforce, to um, improve the uh, standard of our army. Yeah. Yeah. Instead, our generals, our rulers built palaces for themselves, collected wealth, etc. And now they come back and say that we should come back to power and continue what we were doing. Yeah, unfortunately. Um... We're always late. We, we, we should have done things that we didn't do. Always when I speak, they speak, to, why did, what happened that from those greater Armenia, only this part is left? What did yeah. we do to prevent? What did we do to, to come to this? I always replied what we should should have done and didn't do. This is the reason that this has happened. Well, I mean, this is a completely different topic yeah, that we can it get is, involved but... it, it, really deep into it. But obviously, we all know the reasons why they didn't do it. And, and um, yeah. it's unfortunate. And, and now we're paying the price. Yeah. Now let's go to the next one. Not many left. This, the areas shown blue are the ones that given to, were given to Azerbaijan no, yeah. from Armenian territory and also from Artsakh territories. Hmm. Okay, next yeah. one. Uh, this is a map of the enclaves in our, inside Armenia and in Azerbaijan. The blue one, the blue arrow, shows Artsvashen, an Armenian enclave which is inside Azerbaijan. Yeah. And the two red ones on top are in the Tavush region, two enclave, Azeri enclaves in Armenia, which were established in 1936. And the green one at the bottom is the Tikranashen enclave, which was given to Azerbaijan in 1940. Now, except for Artsvashen, there's no record of how and why were these areas given to Azerbaijan. Yeah, I was about to ask. I mean, how is there this, proof how is, of yeah, how is this? How is this possible? How is this designated? It it appeared on Soviet maps, and that was all. It's just in, was, so was somebody it, just drew it, but, like moved the line, basically. But, yeah, wait, but wait, wait, hold, Baron Ruben. The only thing that could come to mind is were these some sort of strategic locations based on the dates that yeah. you're giving us? Um, with let's say the Soviet Union um, housing military or something I will, strategic. I'll come to that. I'll come. To okay. That. Oh, I don't want to jump the gun. Okay. Now, the blue enclave 
Ars Vashen inside Azerbaijan is a remote corner of Azerbaijan that there's no roads, nothing connecting to, it, to anything. So it's strategically unimportant. Mm -hmm. The green one sits on the Armenian highway going from Yerevan yeah. to Goris to Karabakh to Iran, Meghri and Iran. If that road is cut, our lorries and buses could not travel to that area, to, to southern or southern Armenia, because the bypassing roads are village roads so narrow that a lorry cannot go through it. Wow. The two red ones on top, on the right hand side, it sits on the highway going to Azerbaijan, Kazakh. And the left one is a larger, I'll show in detail later. And, uh, that itself is no, no, the, the, this one is the Arswashen enclave, the blue circles sitting. The red is the Armenian highway going to Karabakh, etc. Straight through the middle of it. Right through the middle of it. Yeah. And the black line below is the Azeri border. Now, if you give the control, why should Soviet Union give Azerbaijan the control of Armenian highways? Is this okay. strategically important or not important? Of course it is. Of course it is. Of course it is. It's the intention of the Russians to keep control to Azerbaijan, who is, is their closest ally than Armenia. The next yeah. one. <sighs> next. next slide. Yeah. Now, this is the one, the two that I was mentioning. The one at the bottom right is Vahudarlu enclave. The yellow road you see passes through it. Mm -hmm. through so it can be stopped. But the left branch of the yellow road goes to the left. It doesn't pass through the enclave. Yeah. It passes through nearby. But these two wedge tape, wedge shaped areas, the, the Azeri border in 1920 was the green line that runs along the river there between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Now is the black line. But in 1920s, it was the green line. So these under so the, below the below the green line you see two wedge shaped areas it's a blank empty land nothing grows there nothing grows there those two were given to azerbaijan in order to cut the armenian highways in other words these two if azeris sit there they cut the con con connection line from noemberian to tbilisi yeah now the, these these enclaves that they gave, gave let's say, uh, no Azerbaijani actually lives there, right? No, lived, hmm. lived. The Azerbaijanis lived there, so they lived in hundreds of other places in Armenia. There were two hundred Azerbaijani majority villages in Armenia. Why didn't they give them? And there are hundreds of Armenian living Azeris uh, in, uh, villages in Azerbaijan. And let's go to a larger extent, Artsakh. Should have been an Armenian enclave. This, this, yeah, I mean, you would one would think logically speaking, this has a lot to do with uh, resources, mm -hmm. you know, resources. Yeah, and to claim these things, you need to have you know to have some guts to come up in the international platforms and talk about this. I don't know how politicians do that. It, or it, it's it's such an yeah confusing song and dance it is that's why we are here at the two today yeah so okay. at the time in 1920s when the regions were handed over to azerbaijan there were opposition from armenian side one instance one of our famous writers axel bakuns from goris he was part of the, one of the commissions that was dotting and giving lands to azerbaijan he opposed them, they wouldn't sign this in the minutes of the meetings. We know what happened to it after a couple of years. He was shot in our Yerevan prison. Anyway, wow. this was Soviet rule. So, next. I don't even know how to respond to these. <laughs> in, uh, in uh, between 1920 and 1930 to 
1970, Soviet Union drew military maps. This black line is the border between Azerbaijan and Armenia. On the right, on the top is Azerbaijan. On the left, bottom is Armenia. This is the Sevlich, Black Lake region. Again, Black Lake. It's large lake because there are two, one and small, small and large. The large one is called Black Lake. Kara Su. Kara in Persian, in Turkish, black. In all the Azeri, Azeri language, Arch, large. Yeah. So this black line was approved by the Azeri and Armenian representatives as the country region with as the border between these two countries in 1969 and 70 and the ministry of uh, i think the next uh, slide does show that can you go to the next yes mm -hmm. yeah you see on on the top map this is the region the blue is the lake the line goes through the little segment on the top of the lake on the top of it yeah and then continues the one that i showed this, this, it has the signatures of both Armenian and Azeri delegations, representatives of it. The it, map below. This see, is 1971. This I mean, is 1970. 1970, yes. 70. And it was valid until 1990, the demise of the Soviet Union. The land map below was shown to our border guard by Azeri saying this is the map, the, the, the uh, border. You see on the lake, <laughs> It extends well below the name. Well below it, yeah. On, on the left, there's also a bulge coming into territory, Ishkhanasar. They produce these maps, falsified the maps, and say these are the borders, not the one above. And wow. I don't know if our, if our soldiers have the original, actual one with their signatures and stamps to show them that these are not one. This, this is the way to <laughs> I mean, like, who made this decision? Like, Azerbaijan, is, uh, yeah, yeah, I know, for sure. But I'm asking rhetorically because it almost felt feels like somebody just took a map to a marker, decided yeah, to, to to that, to yeah. prove it as as something that is now doctrine. Yeah. Any height that can be strategic was taken up by Azerbaijan all along this border. Oh my goodness. goodness! If you come back to the uh, the other slide, okay. No, the back. Oh, the back one. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Return. Okay. See, the, yeah. the black line is the actual border signed by both, and the red one is the one that they come up with. <laughs> wow. This is unbelievable, man. Oh, my God. This map is actually a copy of the Soviet military map that have added the red on it, which is kept, which is secret. No, should, nobody should see it. They have it, but nobody is allowed to see it. But someone has put the, all these maps on the internet. So I well, think cats it. out of the bag, huh? <laughs> this is unbelievable. Wow. See? This is the thing, sort of things has happened all around where Azerbaijan has come to shore just as this is our land. Sotk, this is this is our land. They've drawn the map and they're coming forward. But now our 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 is our government or military are, are they care? fighting back with this as far as they, hey wait a minute what, we have these what i know in the beginning when they came to save leech the black uh, lake yeah uh, our forces were ordered not to shoot mm -hmm. so there were scuffles there were fights between azeri and <laughs> armenian soldiers but because the Azeris had the gun could use it and the armenians were not allowed Minister of Defense ordered them not to shoot because we won't don't want this to escalate to another war. I mean, all for the sake of diplomacy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's all right. Let's go to... Now, uh, there's a policy of uh, Azerbaijan since it it was established in 1918. That uh, I'll read it for you because I haven't included that. Uh, the Soviet Union expected that each country and each republic should have its own unique history, culture, and language. This is the Soviet Union. It was mm -hmm. announced in 1930. To achieve this, the Azerbaijani authorities found out how to make individual history and culture. 
for their newly born country. If you don't have a past, how can you make it your individual history and purpose? One, they claim that Caucasian Albanians were their, ans their ancestors in order to appropriate yeah. the Christian monuments. And when they're talking to uh, Western powers, they said, we are heirs of the Albanians who built all these churches. But they forget that those churches were built during the 12th to 16th, 18th centuries, while the Albanians had converted into Islam. Did the Islamic Albanians build the churches? And one and one thing, another thing, when they claim that they're the heirs of our Albanians to be state powers, when they speak to Turkey, to Erdogan, they said we are the same, we're the, the same race divided into the two countries, same people. We're both always Turks. We cannot make any decision of what his ancestry is. It depends where what suits, and it changes from one to the other. Yeah, I mean, we've heard all the claims, you know. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, yeah. it's common there knowledge is, with the claims. They also say that the indigenous people living, the Armenians, they came there on 1828 when the Russian <laughs> forces brought them from Iran. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. comical at this point. Yeah, yeah. It is comical for people who know about it, but for a European who sits, it, it doesn't know anything. For an American, doesn't know anything. This. It's new news. It's new news. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's true. It can be true. Unless somebody writes it, something against it. That's why I started this. In I Soviet, think the... Soviet times, there were these uh, allegations were present. Azerbaijan is saying the Armenian is the commerce. Our historians wrote articles against them, but they wrote in Armenian, and one or two were translated into Russian. Yeah. But Azeris yeah. were printing books in English and distributing it. No. Yeah. Who in the West reads Armenian or Russian literature? Nobody. Well, that's the biggest problem with us. I mean, we have some amazing historical books in Armenia, but no yeah. one ever translated. Yeah. You know, so yeah. nobody reads it. Nobody knows about it. Only we, I mean, that's the biggest problem with our community, especially in the diaspora. Everything that, that, that we do, we keep it within our you know uh, our circle and you're not and, trying to introduce and, and, it to other people yeah it's yeah. not introduced to other people and then we uh, part of us is like i feel like we didn't realize what Azerbaijan is doing we didn't realize what they're doing we were just going yeah. along with our like, lives like Barun Ruben said we've we've arrived late to everything yeah, yeah. you know yeah in 19, 2002 when i was drafting my book historic maps of armenia where i proved that there's no Azerbaijan north of Iraq River in 1918 I took the book to one of the top historians in the university here, a well-known person, Bakken, mm -hmm. Jan. I said, I'm preparing this book. He said, that you're wasting your time. Everybody knows that these are Armenian. Why do you waste time with writing it a book, wasting money printing it? I said, nobody knows in the West. You may know here, but nobody in the West knows about it. Unless you write something against it, it's exposing the truth. Everybody will believe that. And then he said, yeah, look, uh, I'd like to edit your book. I said, no, thank you. It's my book. I'll yeah. You know, you know what, you know, you know what it, you know, when people look at maps now, Google maps, mm -hmm. yeah. Think about it. It's like everybody views an article. You don't read, read the article. You just look at the look heading. At yeah. And then get your information from the heading without reading the article and you move on to the next article. Yeah. Read the heading. It's the same thing as looking at maps. Think about it. They'll look at a map. These are the borders. Oh, this is Azerbaijan. Oh, this is blah, 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 so-and-so place. They'll never think about, okay, wait a minute. Maps have shifted. The world has changed over yeah. 50 years, 100 years, 300 years. What, who occupied these areas prior to this? They don't critically and think anymore. Azerbaijan understands this. That's why they lobby... Especially yes. in the U.S., yes, heavily throughout the world, they spend millions lobbying. Absolutely, yeah. There's budget for literature, printing literature in English, but 15 years ago was seven million dollars a year. At the same time, I was in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of our new U.S. Publications Department. He said, "What yeah. is your budget? Seventy thousand dollars." <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> the fraction. 
fraction. One hundred. One hundred. Sorry. Anyway, let's go back to this. And the, the third thing that in Azerbaijan they're implementing is if you can appropriate any monument, do it. If you cannot do it, you destroy it. <laughs> now, these on the screen are the, is the medieval uh, cemetery in Julfa. Mm -hmm. On the left top, you can see the thousands of Khachkars that existed there in 1905. It's a little bit bigger. From from about 10,000 Khachkars, the Russian army used 5,000 to use as a railway slippers when they were constructing the railway line there. But 5,000 were left up to 1995, 96. Those two figures on top on the right are the images in 96. Mm -hmm. Then in 97, the Azeris, uh, Azerbaijanis came in and started breaking the Khachkars, toppling them over, breaking. Yeah. And the army was brought to break them by sledgehammers. And on the right, you can see they were dumping into the Rocks River the bits of stone. And today, it is military ground, maneuver ground. That area. Now, when it, it, the, the destruction had begun, the, Azeri, the German foreign ministry wrote to the uh, Azeri, uh, Azerbaijani ambassador asking, we have heard about the damage to Armenian monastery and the monuments being done there, the cemetery. Uh, could you explain it, please? And uh, after a couple of months, the reply came said, no, no damage has been done there. They, it's a, it's a, it's other strategic location because there, there's lots of earthquake in that area. Because of the earthquake, all the Khachkars have been toppled over. <laughs> right? And these, by the way, these are not Armenian. These are Aldanian, Azerbaijani Aldanian. Of course. Three years, oh, they start man. removing them. If they're yours own, your own monuments, why do you destroy them? Yeah, how why are you respecting your ancestors? Now, this is the sort of policy. Here is the pictures taken from Iranian side while they were doing it. There's the videos also of this. Yeah, we've seen this. Next these. picture. There we go. Okay. Now, in 2007, they pro uh, produced a book, which you can see on the right, The Monuments of Western Azerbaijan. This is the French from 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 the French book of the copy. It's, it includes the map of Armenia. It says the map of the the homeland of the Oghuz Turks, which today is called Armenia, but it was the old land of the Turks. And, and the book published in English, in, in English, German, French, uh, even Arabic. There was seven languages published and distributed in book fairs. It's a big, large book. It's got 130 pages. Each page contains each uh, couple of pages contain a monument, Armenian monument, such as uh, Eshmiazin Church, saying Turkish Christian Temple. Urartu Turkish uh, Garni Turkish Temple. Everything is Turkish, 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 Albanian, etc. The whole plot, the whole book. Next slide shows a couple of examples. Okay. On top is Tate Monastery. It says Turkish Monastery. But below you can see. This. On the left is Havarzin. On the right is Goshavank. All these are Turkish Christian temples. Turkish Christian. <laughs> yeah, who are Christian Turks? We were yet to find out. Okay. Next one. Repsime, the Vart notes on the top. And Khorvirab, also Turkish temple. Really? Yes. I, I, well, I feel what's, like. What's in the you know air they're breathing? I, I, I what's feel in like... the air they're breathing? I'm curious. It's like what? someone who's standing there is so stupid. Like you don't know what to do to, no. like whatever you do, it's not going to fix it. It's not. It's like, it's like, oh my god, it's unbelievable. 
It's not stupidity. It's the people up top know the truth. They just need to convince the masses that that is, that does yeah, not yeah. exist. It's like, listen, listen, I'm not, again, nobody, please, I need to give this disclaimer. We've talked about this off camera, obviously. There's a lot of people that have talked about Ali of being this intelligent human being, yada, 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 right? We've, we've all heard this rhetoric. We know he knows the truth. We know Erdogan knows the truth. We know a lot of people in the area oh, yeah. know the truth. They're, they just need to convince their masses or else they're going to lose know, control. I don't think Aliyev knows the truth because he's one of the really? ones where, where their maps showing uh, the region. Oh, but and you don't think he was, was going along with it? No, no. He, 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 was, he was looking at the, at the map of med medieval times, of early medieval times of the region. Okay. And he, he saw the names of the uh, Ottoman Empire, Persian mm -hmm. Empire, etc. He says, where is Azerbaijan? Is there's a video. <laughs> <laughs> Why haven't you shown Azerbaijan? <laughs> it was never there. And in 2005, oh. he announced in the Academy of Sciences that I suggest that all our uh, historians and, uh, and specialists concentrate their effort to prove that Armenians are have not existed in this region. After three years, he gave up cash prizes to those scientists who've proven that the Armenians didn't exist here. I think the biggest problem also is us Armenians, um, uh, diaspora or even Armenia. I think we've been so occupied with our own, I guess call it vanity, whatever, yeah. uh, but that we didn't pay attention to what the enemy was doing behind us. And, you know, we, we've talked, we've mentioned this so many times, Bono Ruben, on our show about how we have multi billionaires, successful Armenians who will waste money on, on the dumbest things in the world and will never invest in, you know, this type of uh, uh, educational. Like you said, the book's being translated. Um, uh, we have a fan who's actually going to translate one of, um, uh, uh, what's her name? I keep forgetting. Anna, Anna, it was Anna, right? Yeah. yeah Anna. Anna. Um, she's going to, she's in Armenia right now. now. Yeah. Um, and she's translating um, Things book. Um, oh my God, why am I stumbling? Uh, Angela, uh, uh, Tal Angela Talian. Yeah, Talian's uh, book. Uh, and she, she's, she's, she just, passion project she contacted her and she went there and she's translating into english and they're going to try to obviously publish it here in the u.s this should be almost like warfare we should be doing this on everything because we're sitting here and they are constantly putting these falsified books out there yeah and, and we, is, we don't see it you know lobby. they're publishing it in europe and, and even in the u.s or yeah, canada but... and we're not seeing it because we're not paying attention well, I had no. first standing uh, experience on those. One of these books, Historic Maps of Armenia, I published in Armenian and Russian also. So I wrote to Mr. Abraham Yanidu, richest, richest Armenian in Moscow, saying that I'm writing this book, I've written this book in English, translated into English. It proves that the Azerbaijan didn't exist. It shows Armenia through the ages, how it came about. Uh, a friend of his said, yet you send it to him, he will take care of it. Doesn't matter, it's $20,000 to pu publish the book in Russia the, on a coffee table book, you know, that sort of a thing. It's mm -hmm. nothing. So I sent it, made a I sent him a copy of the English version, large book. It's about 12 inches by 11, uh, by 13 inches, uh, large book, colored book. And with a letter explaining that the Russian version is, because I think it's useful for Russians to know of this as well. No reply. After about three months, uh, I saw his friend who said, oh, no, he probably hasn't received it. Give me a copy. I will hand carry it and then give it to him. I've never heard from him. Not, didn't even bother to say, no, thank you. I don't have money for this sort of thing. While our politicians, or uh, one of the Sergis in Albania, the foreign minister, where I sent the his invention of history book to him, saying, please have a look at it. This has interesting information. After two weeks, I called his office. Uh, I knew the secretary. The secretary told me that I've asked him to have a look and let you know. He told me, I don't have time to read these sort of things. 
Wow. Wow. This is the Minister of Foreign Affairs. The, what's have, his name again? You don't have time to do these things. Al Ghanian. Huh. Previously, when Oskanian was the Prime Minister, he asked me to give as many of, of these books to him so, so that he could give to the foreign guests, distribute to the foreign guests. Mm -hmm. and in his time, 1,500 copies of the abridged version was purchased by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to be handed out. When this guy came, he, this was his answer. He said, oh, I don't have to time for this. Now, is this book uh, still available? Could it be purchased? Yes. They're, they're, but the original, the old version, no. No, these books have sold out, have been sold out. Historic maps okay. of Armenia, there are a few odd copies second hand you can find in Amazon. Okay. But the abridged version has, I, I had a print run of about 4,000. A few, I have left a few only. Okay. Are are you planning to republish any any of them, or if somebody gives the money, yes, if somebody provides the funds. Because I, I'm a retired person living on yeah. my retirement salary. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll we'll make some yeah. calls. Yeah. Can, yeah. Then uh, the English can... version. I'm like, I'm curious about the English version because that well, we need to get this in the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Are you kidding me? You you go to my website, rubengalician.com. Mm -hmm. And all the books are there, and it's a free download. Have a look at them. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, we'll we'll definitely uh, uh, it's time uh, time to start reach out to to our contributing to everybody we no, know. Seriously, get the minions going. <laughs> yeah, we need we need some soldiers, guys. Who's down to volunteer? Well, I mean, right now, uh, El, uh, Ellen, Ellen is saying, uh, "How much? How much yeah, does he how need?" Much does he, yeah, somebody. Win. Somebody asking, how much do you need? <laughs> off camera, guys. Off camera. Uh, we'll, we'll put you through with Elena. Elena is an amazing human being. She has she has a lot of knowledge she has, herself. She does yes. so much yeah. uh, for 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 our cause. So, um, okay, uh, we're we definitely have some questions coming up. I'm sure you can yeah. see the chat Wait, on the side. What's what's the next slide? I think is the last one. Uh, where two are more slides? Two more slides. Two more slides. Is, uh, yeah, what's it just? The, aerial photograph of the Ararat mountains with Armenia in the background. It looks very peaceful mm -hmm. <laughs> from space. It's 20 kilometers up. And the last one is the uh, image shows my books that I've published so far. Yeah. yeah. In different languages. Okay. Uh, how, how many books in total? I would say one. 22 if each language book is counted separately. I think 22, 23. 22. Wow. That is amazing. And this is all in the past uh, 20 years, I want to say, right? Started 2004, the first book. Okay. Guys, so this, is, this, is, this is a treasure trove of information. Start looking into these things. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've ever caught yourself staring at maps. I know I have in my lifetime plenty of times. Maybe not to the level of a Baron Ruben, but you know this is this is unbelievable information to to hone in on, you know. Yeah, I wanted maybe, to ask. Maybe, you, my uh, last book is sort of a is a summary, is a summary of all these things that I said to, we talked about today, uh, okay. and it's an intended for uh, uh, to be used in schools as material for teaching, okay. not a text book but material for teaching the ministry okay. approved it. I sent 2,000 copies of it to each school in Armenia every school every school in Armenia has copies and the senior schools have four or five copies so I've done it and I, the English version is coming out this month okay well let us know yeah uh, please let, let us know, know. Uh, no. we can possibly get it out to schools here yeah yeah we'll yeah. definitely talk to some people yeah, we'll um talk to some people here let's take some questions from the audio uh, 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 to everybody who's joining us if you have any questions ask but uh if can you read that right there that's from um, uh, I can't De Vurutsu. okay De Vurutsu. um i've spoken to her before so uh her question is question for the discussion later on what can mr galician tell about demographic policies or strategies after changing borders and maps moving people in and out to form majorities 
Well, this is uh, what has been done during the Soviet times. The Soviets took certain races of people and moved from Crimea to Central Asia, Crimean Tatars, what they call, so that they get rid of the of a problem. They encouraged Azeris to come to Armenia to uh, to live in come to live in Armenia. There were over two hundred thousand Azeris living in Armenia until the the fall of the Soviet Union, and all almost all villages on the border with Azerbaijan were majority Azeri population. If Azerbaijan hadn't done anything regarding the war and fighting us, and the, the Soviet Union had continued to do what is its destructive work, in 50 years' time, Azerba the Azerbaijanis would, would have been majority in Armenia. So this is type of demographic things that was, was happening. And I'm glad to say that it, it was stopped at a higher cost to us, the war. But this stopped. And none of these villages are occupied by Azeris now yeah. inside Armenia. Hmm. And um, uh, during Soviet times, during pre-Soviet times, in uh, Tsarist time, when the Transcaucasian area was occupied by Russians. Every 10 years, they changed the borders of the names of the provinces in order to ease their administration, never paying any attention to the demography of the, system, of the regions. Armenian regions were given to the uh, Azerbaijanis. Azerbaijani region was given to Georgia. I don't know, this sort of things continued for until 1918 until the independent republics were formed. But this is the general trend of the Russians' attitude toward, towards demography. Uh, Meg uh, had a question. She was saying, um, I, I'm left wondering why Albanians stopped making their stone crosses and all these artifacts that left behind. Was it to become more European? I, th I think she was being sarcastic. sarcastic. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, responded okay. to that a little, right. little while ago. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, I think that's it. Guys, you have any more questions? Yeah. We had uh, one question. That's it? Come really? on. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to ask you about the book, The uh, Invention of History, which is Azerbaijan, Armenia, and showcasing, uh, I guess, the documents, the culture and history of Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, can you give us like a little bit of a, uh, I guess, enlighten us about it? Like, uh, what made you yeah, write well, it? And, and... The book, uh, in the book, uh, the old... The other name, first of all, the name Azerbaijan is discussed where it came come from. And then it's a policy of Azerbaijan to own everything and uh, forget everything that is existed there for centuries, etc. And uh, I give, uh, I bring out quotes from the Azeri historians, etc. Uh, in the book that says these, uh, the real facts, what they existed and today how they are translated into modern Azerbaijan. You know, the, in Azerbaijan, the written language was Persian until end, almost end of the 19th century. They didn't have a written Turkish language. So everything was written in Persian. Uh, I'll give you Are you talking a, about the southern part of which was called Azerbaijan or actual Azer, the one that no, they actual, call Azerbaijan? Actual Azerbaijan in Baku area, etc. the uh -huh. historian that at the time wasn't called Azerbaijan, it was Shirvan and uh, yeah. Shaki yeah. and I don't know various in the regional names for them. And historians, yeah. for instance, uh, there's a historian called Haji Harabari. He's written, mm -hmm. he written history of Harabari in 1844. In his book, which is in Persian, he writes in Persian, so I'm Ar Ar Armenian from Iran, so I can read this book. Uh, I, I read that the, he says about the city of Barda, Barda, which is in, in, in Turkish is Barda, eh, in Iran, in Farsi. In the city of that is the population is main, uh, mainly Armenian, which is mm -hmm. was one of the capitals of uh, the old uh, Shirvan. 
And I, and, and took up the Nedori to see what what this book was translated translated not translated but transliterated into present Azeri. But because it was Farsi, it was translated also translated and written in the modern language. I found that in the, the Russian translate uh, transliteration in 1958, it's exactly the same is written that the Barda was considered mainly Armenian population. Then uh, I, I took up the 1980 volume, published it, published it. That sentence has been removed from the translation. It cancelled. Any name of Armenian in the whole works has been removed and replaced by Albanian. And when I spoke about this, to uh, uh, I presented the book in the European Union in 19, uh, in 20, 11 in Brussels. I presented the book in the, among the audiences of what 150 people. There were five Azeris from embassy and one was a student. The other was well, um, embassy workers. End of my talk when I question answered it. Um, and by the way, going back to the book, and he said repeatedly where are Iranian scholars have been described as Azeri scholars, not Iranian scholars. One is Tusi, who was one of the famous uh, astrology, astronomers in Iran. Tus is a uh, region in eastern Iran. So Tusi, since he built his uh, uh, as, uh, observatory in Karaba, in Maraga, which is as Iranian Azerbaijan, uh, he is Azeri. He is not Turkish. He is not Persian. This sort of thing goes on and on about historians, about Moses Karangat, what see they say is that Azeri historian, not Armenian. No, no of... Moses Korenati <laughs> is Azeri? <laughs> no, Moses Korenati, they didn't hadn't dared to touch that one. <laughs> no, no, Moses Korenati Che. Uh how uh, uh, oh I thought he said Moses. No, 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 Khorinati. not Korenati. Uh, 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 God, I have trouble saying, uh, pronouncing his last name. Agabandati? Oh, oh, not... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I, I yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've he's, read up on he's him. Yeah. Azeri. He's Azeri. He's not army. Yeah. Oh, okay. So anyway, okay. when I spoke about these things in the book with proofs, extracts from the books, etc., etc., and of them, one of them got up and said that, that you say that our historians and uh, uh, politicians are uh, lying. He said you are lying. Your historians are lying. You yourself are lying. I said okay, that's. Do you believe in your historians that have written in your own language in the 19th century? Yes, of course I do. I said, but you have a problem. They're written in Persian. You cannot read Persian. <laughs> nobody can read their old literature because they've changed the alphabet so many times that nobody has access to them. It makes, it makes you Except wonder if it's done on selective. purpose. Anyway, one of them got up and said, my mother is from Iran. I said, good. I suggest you go to the Academy of Arab Sciences, get a print of the microfiche of this Arabari's book, and go and buy this, this book, which is translated into your language today, in Latin block script, and compare them. And then you see who's lying, me or you. <laughs> that was the first and last question from any Azeri I have encountered anywhere in the world. Because I'm proving things with their from their yeah. own by their own sources. Yeah, I don't. Refer it's to almost our... like a trump card. Yeah, yeah of course it is. Are you kidding me? This is. Go and I... have a look at it. Wow, unbelievable! We have people asking. Yeah, we should. We, you should come here and do a TED talk. We can we'll definitely yeah. talk about and that. Suggestion. <laughs> yeah, suggestion. We have one question from Emily Wilson, who uh, is one of our fans who joins us from Georgia in Georgia in the United States. Yeah. Uh, she's asking, uh, uh, this may be a silly question, such thing as silly questions, but would Mar Marash in historic Armenia have been in the region of considered to be Cilicia? Uh, Marash is not in Cilicia, it's in Greater no. Armenia. It's in Greater Armenia, okay. okay. Well, um, that answered that question. Uh, oh, not well, we Adana is in Cilicia, yeah. Elena asked the question, where can we find the map that proves our real borders? There are no real borders. The borders yeah. change all the time politically. It depends what time you're talking about, what period you're talking about. In the Middle Ages, there were no borders drawn because 
by the time the borders were, if, if there was a border, by the time the uh, cartographer drew the border, drew it. it would have taken mm. eight, ten, 10 years to do that, and the border would have changed. Yeah. yeah. Somebody revise. somebody would have presented new information as we discussed until, earlier. Well, until the 14th, 15th century, maps did not contain borders, just names yeah. of the people who lived there, yeah. the name of the area. To no add to that, uh, Meg had a good question. She asked, uh, uh, what would you, your first action be if you could change anything right now? Which map would you focus on basically bringing it to... Uh, uh, to life and, and moving forward, pushing it to with all this situation right now? Well, uh, I would uh, oppose all these people that uh, say that we should claim Armenian lands from Turkey and greater Armenia, etc., etc. Well, I, I was asked this question a few years ago in, in, in a television show in Yerevan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tell them, let me ask you a question with a question. Uh, if we take the area of Mush, Van, Marash, all these areas, it, there, there is about 150,000 square kilometers into Armenia. This region would continue about 20 million, 25 million Kurds and 2 million Armenians, 3 million. What would you call that country? Kurdistan or Armenia? Well, if you, if you look at the, the, the you know, uh, no, the so claim if you call places the, based on yeah, yeah people it would yeah. be Kurdistan. Let's, yeah, it would so be let's Kurdistan. be realistic. Let's be yeah. realistic. Yeah. What re is realistic is that first of all, people of Artsakh should have their own decision, should make their own decision to be independent for Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. We cannot mm -hmm. force them to because we have no say in their internal affairs. And politically we have withdrawn from other Artsakh. This these people they are their own. So I'm talking about Armenia as a country of Armenia. Today, mm -hmm. the realistic one is the map of 1926 Armenia that I showed you. Okay. If we can achieve that, go back to 31,000 square kilometers of our land, it will be at the greatest achievements for the century. Well, we have people commenting saying that we can call it the United States of Greater <laughs> Armenia. <laughs> Uh, or just call it Western Armenia and let them live there. Uh, I mean, listen, I I, I understand that, it, great, you know, but... of course, if the genocide didn't happen, then a lot more Armenians would be there than 2 million. Um, but yeah. it's, you know, the Kurds might be more understandable. The Kurds know that that's where the Armenians were. Well, so haven't maybe been... some kind of a, repa a you know, repatriation repatri yeah. could... Yeah could have happened where people, you know, there's a lot of people here in the U S that would love to go to that, that region and maybe buy a house and build, you know, do things. So it, uh, it's, it's saying these things and that they wish we, I would like to go, etc. is one thing and doing it is yeah, it's romanticizing. Yeah. Um, we, we Armenians here, they plan to populate Karabakh, the, uh, the, uh, sort of liberated lands with the Armenians, but it didn't happen. Well, like Meg said, we have to be realistic. You oh, know? yeah, uh, we have to be realistic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, regarding uh, leaving Kurds as a Kurdish minority, a Kurdish majority in Armenia, etc., the first time the election comes, the citizens vote for a government who would be in the parliament, all Kurds, if it's yeah. a the greater Armenia. So mm -hmm. let's, we should be it's realistic with this. Yeah. It's a very good point. Yeah. See? Um, well, um, anything you want to mention? Anything coming up? Any lectures or, you know, uh, well, but we know people can follow on your website, yeah. right? The website yes. again was. Go on to his website, guys. Follow. It was rubengalician.com. Yes. Is that what it was? RubenGalician.com is the website that you see my articles and my books. Uh, I don't put news things. Yeah. Ooh, uh, I, I forgot that. Uh, okay. put my, my articles, my uh, such, uh, my uh, television interviews on the Facebook, on my Facebook. But okay, go give the yeah. man a follow. Yeah, I, 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 I've seen you recently on on a lot of the Armenian news channels. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah. giving your thoughts at the current situation. Um, Two questions before we let you go. 
one what are your thoughts of with 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 the current situation what do you see happening um what are your predictions um well uh, it's a difficult time that we live in very difficult positive decisions to make but one one of the important ones that i always have been saying is that that uh, CSTO what Armenian cup hopk the security uh, system with the Russians and Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan etc etc it's not working because those countries have closer ties with Azerbaijan than Armenia yeah. we should withdraw from that military pact it doesn't mean that it, that we cut the real civil relations with Russia no we come out of the military pact and Iran is announcing that he wants to have a military pact with Armenia. Interested in yeah. the protection of borders, etc. Yep. And I'm glad to see that there are uh, politicians now have closer relations with the West and the US than the previous one did. And there is a const constant traveling between the, 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 the officials from one country to the other, discussing details, discussing even arms sales did today through other intermediaries etc so that our you know that uh, i paid we have paid hundreds of millions to russia for armaments for arms which they have not delivered yeah he, yep. he mentioned that today not yeah. delivering. so this is the sort of thing we should stand up against and uh, my wish is that our uh, politicians have enough guts to stand up on international <laughs> media and talk about the real problems yeah yeah that that is very true that's a, um, that's a conundrum the, the, there's one question we always ask our guests and it is our time machine question mm -hmm. and the question goes if if there was a time machine if we ever build one what time era in armenian history would you like to go see i'd like to do the 12th 13th century go back and live oh. in that culturally rich time <laughs> post holy wars or near the end of the holy wars yeah the crusades yeah mm -hmm. nothing to do not crusaders no either. no no, no. <laughs> greater okay. mm. yeah awesome all Actually, right that's the first time we've heard that answer yeah yeah well, so everybody usually no. says urartu, no. urartu or tigran meds or yeah. uh, it's very or the very beginning yeah to see hike yeah. now <laughs> yeah to high, see hike now yeah. yeah interesting um, Baron Ruben, uh, we cannot thank you enough for you doing this and being part of our little show here in the United States. Uh, you know, we again, we to everybody who joined us live, we appreciate it. Thank um, you, this audio version will be mm -hmm. on all the plat uh, podcast platforms worldwide. Uh, those of you who will be listening to it, you might want to come watch the video to see all the maps. This tell, was amazing. Tell your friends. Um, and we will definitely um, uh, reach out to you. Uh, we'll make some calls. Uh, again, we're, we're always, you know, we're serious about this stuff. Yes. We try to help however we can to uh, get our history uh, uh, out there in English. There's a reason why we do this show in English uh, is for uh, not just Armenians to um, you know the, the new generation yeah, and I'm, the non I'm all for it. I'm all for it yeah. because we want yeah. to uh, let the international audience yeah. know about it, not just of ourselves. Course. Of course, Absolutely. of course. We we have a lot of non-Armenian listeners on the podcast platform, and we're thankful for them. And uh, uh, definitely, we we want to get all these books translated and in your English versions out uh, as well to get them out over here in the. In, in the diaspora in the west and yeah. so forth um but again uh we'll, we'll talk to you off air uh about this stuff but uh, sure. uh we wish you a great day um uh, uh, rest of your day in in yerevan yeah <laughs> and uh we wish you health um and uh thank you again for everything you've done for for our culture and and uh that the information you've brought forth it's yeah, so educational amazing. and amazing it just opens your eyes well, thank you, thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you, and uh, I, I I wish uh, more more listeners for your programs. The more, the better. We're, thank you. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah, this information will get out. Yes, a lot slowly more, but a surely. Lot more people. 
Yeah. Please, if you are doing, uh, putting anything on YouTube, etc., send me links. Send me links. Absolutely. Okay. We will okay. do that. Well, this is this is on YouTube Live right now, yeah. so uh, I'll forward you the pre uh, after the recording. Yeah. I'll send you the link so you can share it. And by the way, this is on your is this is airing on your Facebook page as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. technology, you gotta love it. <laughs> yeah. I never yeah. thought that we'd get here. When I was studying in university, we had one computer in the university. They occupied the whole of the basement area. <laughs> Indeed, less, less than this watch is doing now. Now, yeah, wow. absolutely, wow. absolutely, yeah. Well, um, all right. Well, you enjoy the rest of your day, and like I said, we'll talk to you off air. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. We'll keep in touch. All right, take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right, that, that was awesome. Man. That was I mean, great. And yeah, you know, I have a I have a thing for maps. Mm -hmm. I always stare at maps a lot, a little too much sometimes, but man, listening to him get into the nitty gritty about how this is all processed and how everything yeah. has changed and what meaning it had over time. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Well, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. This was very educational. Thank there's, you for, there's for some, there's some hanging ammo. out with us. Uh, it's a little bit past 11. I know yeah. in the East Coast, it's a lot later. So again, guys, we the reason we do these shows late because uh, when our guests are from Armenia, obviously, you know, uh, there's like an 11 hour difference. So uh, they have to wake up early to join us. Um, but besides that, I want to mention a couple of things. So, you know, last episode, I mentioned about the movie Gates to Heaven mm -hmm. with, uh, uh, with the uh, producer, Jivan Avetisian. Uh, which is going to be uh, here in the States, October th uh, 3rd. No, no, I'm sorry, not October, October 21st, I believe. Um, but it's going to have its first release. It's going to be in, in Glendale. It's going to be in Orange County. It's going to be in Boston, Philadelphia, uh, different uh, states. We mentioned that on the last episode. But uh, the good news is that he's going to be here on October yeah. 13th, and he's going to yeah, join us here in the studio and... Uh, um, it it's going to be half split Armenian English. Uh, there will be somebody here with him yeah, to help hoping. with translation. Uh, but w the reason we want him on the show is because he makes movies telling amazing stories about uh, the Artsakh, the first war yep. and everything that happened. And now he has uh, a new movie come in, which we'll talk about that as well, besides Gates to Heaven. So that will be two weeks from now. Uh, next Thursday, we will be live again, 9 p.m., October 6th, and uh, Haik Nazarian from Hosank uh, yes. will be joining us. Um, he's an amazing guy who used to live here. He decided after the 2016 war to move to Armenia, live there. He actually joined the army, trained. He fought in the last war. Um, so we wanted to talk to him. He has a lot of interesting ideas and about his, um, uh, we don't want to call it a, a political party, but it's sort of a movement, Hosank, that he's kind of trying to get out there. Um, besides that, uh, anything else? No, no, this was, this was yeah, awesome. This man. was great. Like this was, this was me kind of nerding out internally too. Yeah, <laughs> it really was, man. Because I'm, I'm telling you, there, have been, there have been moments. I don't, I'm sure you guys can relate to this. Yeah, there have been moments where I've been stuck staring in at like Google Maps. Yeah, or maybe I'm alone. I don't know. Oh, again, I want to mention uh, the LA showing of uh, Desire to Live, the film by Mariam Avdisian. If you guys are interested, please send us a message through Instagram. Like I said, we're giving away 20 tickets. This have been purchased, paid for it, so it will go to you. Um, this will be at the Lemley Theater in Glendale Sunday, this Sunday, October 2nd at 12 noon. Um, so uh, either message us through Instagram or um, email pod uh, at medheadosnet. That's P-O-D at medheadosnet.com, just how you see our logo. Um, so besides that, follow us on Instagram. Uh, follow us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash Um, You know, support the show, guys. It's very important. It helps us to cover a lot of the cost here. Uh, we got a new Patreon uh, yesterday, yes. so it's growing. 
It's it is. small. It's a small community, but baby it's growing. Steps. Yeah. Baby steps. Yeah. Baby we like steps. to grow organically. So um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit that thumbs uh, button. That helps a lot. Uh, you know, hit that like button and uh, share it with your friends, family. Um, anything Come else? on, guys. We're making history cool for you all. Yeah. Yeah. So, but we'll call it, it night. It is time to depart. Yes, it is time to it depart. It is time to depart. So, having said that, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, as we always say, respect one another, love one another, and till the next episode, take care of yourselves.